Thank you very much. I think before I start, uh, uh, Hiribet is here. I mean, I don't really remember whether I played basketball with you. And it was here in Pune, I think, uh, way back when you were playing for Maharashtra and I was playing for Karnataka, then in the symbiosis campaign. I always thought you became an uh, orthopedic surgeon for some reason, but then it was brilliant listening to you. So uh, uh, one thing is very clear, evidence-based, you know. Okay, so the evidence is very clear. One day evidence, if you play basketball, you'll become good doctors. <laughs> you'll become a good cardiologist at least, but I, I, I don't know about other things. I think we have a lot of things to catch up. Thank you so very much, uh, Chairpersons, and uh, uh, thank you, Sanjay, and uh, thank you, team of IDEC. It, it's been wonderful, and I really enjoyed the hospitality. And uh, we were here at 12 o'clock midnight, and then still... Everything was there. I mean, we, we still had a good time till about 1 a.m. and then we are up here. And uh, I, I don't know who asked me to actually talk about this gut health in diabetes. Can it be improved with diet? I think some guts you have uh, asking me to talk about it. So I had to do a bit of research myself because uh, uh, I have not worked really on this field. So it, it, it's a shitload of work that has to be done and... Well, let, let's see where we go. I think let's just start with the developmental charges. And what we know is the gut microbiota kind of changes from the time we take birth and as we age. And this is something that has been told to us, and we are comfortable with this. From esophagus to anus and from C-section to vaginal delivery, the microbiome changes. Sometimes I feel you have no choice whether you are delivered, you know, by a true section or probably you had a normal delivery, vaginal delivery, because microbiome is supposed to change at that point itself. And as we grow, the changes can happen due to various reasons. You can do a number of tests about microbiome. You know, you can, you can take saliva. You can probably take some aspirations by doing an endoscopy or you can also do some biopsies or the best way of course is a lot of work with the poo and this is exactly what people have been doing. The gold standard is to take the fecal matter and do all the tests because that's still the gold standard. So it, it's a lot of poo and we know that microbiota can be altered Due to various mechanisms, lifestyle can change it, antibiotics can change it, hyperimmunity, immunodeficiency, hygiene, it must have improved because of the COVID. And most importantly, the topic that we are going to discuss today is, can diet actually change the microbiota? That's a question. But before that, when I was making these slides, one thing that crossed my mind was, well, we do give a lot of antibiotics, especially 60, 70% of the admissions in my hospital for diabetes is because of the diabetic foot. We do give antibiotics for eight days, 10 days, 12 days, 14 days for foot infections. And then we just add a lactobacillus. Now, I wanted to look in and see how long do we have to give this lactobacillus? Is it one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, five weeks? I did not get an answer. I will leave that question with all of you, if any one of you are students. What is the period of time that we have to actually give lactobacillus if we have used strong antibiotics for a period of 10 days and 14 days? Because we still don't know this thing. And I tried my best to see whether I can get an answer when I was making this. I didn't get an answer. So I leave that question to the audience. I think. This is something that we all can search. Different things have given different things, and most of them said, you give it for a period of six weeks, and that's about it, because nobody has done any kind of testing on this. So we come back to the question about the diet and the microbiota. We know diet is the crucial regulator of intestinal microflora. Not just the diet, it's also about your genes, medication, and the diet. 
individual's age also has an impact on the microbiota. So in short, the gut microflora plays a very pivotal role in body's metabolism and immunity responses. Okay. And figure on the right here is only for Dr. Neeta Deshpande to just see and enjoy and to give her an idea that I have done some work while preparing these things. Okay, otherwise you don't have to have a look at that particular picture at all. Okay, let's understand the good versus the bad. I wanted to make it look very complicated and that's why that particular slide. You can't even see the names on that particular slide. Okay, there are thousands of bacteria and more than 3,000 genes or 3 million genes or whatever we talk about when it comes to microfiber. You have good, you have bad. You have hundreds and thousands of names in the good microbiota list, hundreds and thousands of names in the bad microbiota list. That's why sometimes it becomes easier when you actually take shelter from Mr. Shah Rukh Khan because in Baiju's, he says you have the advantage of two teachers. One to teach and one to teach you the concepts, okay? Now today I think we have a lot more of teachers here today. So let's just stick to the concept because we all are clinicians. What we need to know is not how to do research when it comes to microbiota, but to understand a little bit more about what we know. This is a very simple cartoon. The red figure is fat. All that it's trying to tell us is somebody is obese. He has bad gut microbiota. If somebody is obese and taking unhealthy food, food rich in fats, food rich in sugar, or what you call as a junk food, probably you have a bad microbiota, and that can have an impact on various other problems. Somebody who is lean, because there is a lean phenotype and there is an obese phenotype. Okay, now anybody obese will have bad microbiota. In addition to that, if they have also junk food, it can actually worsen the problem. But anybody lean here in the green can have good microbiota. I mean, that's the lean phenotype itself. Later on, your diet plays a role and so many other things plays a role. So it's really that simple. <laughs> you have good bugs, you have bad bugs, but they're all gut bugs. So you have to live with them. The food we eat affects our gut bugs. Thousands of species, three million genes, for you and me to understand very simply as clinicians, dietary habits play a very significant role in shaping the microbiota, providing substrates that basically determines the assortment of the metabolites produced. Very simple thing to understand. Some microbiota actually derive good metabolites. So good microbiota, good metabolites, and that has a positive impact on the host. Now what are metabolites? They are nothing but molecular mediators. We can understand this in a very, very simple way. The gut microbiota is a crucial actor that can actually interact with the host by the production of a diverse reservoir of metabolites. Okay, in short, he is the prime minister, he is the home minister, he is the finance minister, he is the defense minister. So is a very, very crucial actor. So when once you understand more about microbiota, and when once we start getting more and more biomarkers to test, like Dr. Hirema did mention about NT pro BNP, because it's expensive, people are not doing it. So similarly, when once we have biomarkers for early diagnosis of a gut which is undergoing dysbiosis 
and a gut which is undergoing symbiosis, that makes the job very easy. I'm sure in a couple of years, we will have these biomarkers. And when once we have these biomarkers, we can diagnose early, we can use it for prognosis, and it can also help us to actually discover new drugs probably in the future. One step back, going back to your bat, in the red is the dysbiosis. One or two names is all that you need to remember. Clostridium difficile, we know, is bad. So if you have a dysbiotic gut, you have more of these bad bacteria. You have a symbiotic gut, what is in the green, like lactobacillus, you have good microbiota. You can also call them as firmicutus for bad and probably bacteriodates for good. And there is a ratio of firmicutus to bacteriotides. So from bad to good, you have a ratio. It's usually about 16 is to 600 or something. One of the slides will also mention this. So when once you have more of harmful gut microbiota, they can also inhibit the good ones. Like, I was a good fellow, never wanted to drink yesterday, and came at 12 o'clock. We had a bad bacteria in Dr. Sanjay, who offered me a drink and made me a bad fellow. Okay, so that's, that's a simple way of explaining how a bad person can influence a good person also to become bad. Or for those of you who are writing exams or who are planning to give lectures, very simple. Healthy microbiota has anti-inflammatory effects, antioxidants, they regulate the gut barrier, they increase the local immune system, they reduce intoxemia, and most importantly for diabetics, improves insulin sensitivity. Dysbiotic gut on this side, pro-inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, IL-10, TNF-alpha, everything has been increased in people with this biotic gut. Local immune response is low. They have increased endotoxemia, reduced insulin resistance, so on and so forth. So this is the concept that you have to remember. The red arrow very clearly tells you that if you have high-calorie diet, high-fat diet, sugary diet, if you are stressful and if you are on antibiotics for whatever reason, you are moving towards a dysbiotic gut. If you are having a healthy diet, prebiotics, probiotics, and probably in future fecal transplantation, on the green, this one arrow, you are moving towards a good health. So this is what I was talking about. There are, there are phenotypes of lean and obese phenotypes. It's got nothing to do with their food. Okay. And a number of people have already done the work. So we don't really have to go into this. So the lean phenotype are known to have better immune. Okay. So let's go and see how a dysbiotic gut actually worsens the problem. It increases short-chain fatty acids, increases the appetite. Now, that's the problem. There are some people who say, I just can't manage my appetite. It's tremendous. I feel like eating 10 slices of bread or whatever it is. And some people can actually manage their appetite. So somebody with an increased appetite, for all you know, can have a dysbiotic gut. When once they have an increased appetite, they have an increase in energy absorption. And what's happening in a dysbiotic gut is, importantly, there is an increase in the SGLT1 expression. So the diabetes world is actually waiting for twin blockers, both SGLT1 and SGLT2 blockers. When once they're available, I think we should be able to manage a dysbiotic gut or probably reduce the absorption at that level itself. So what all can it cause a dysbiotic gut? Obesity, hyperglycemia, dyslipidemia, hypertension, NAFLD, irritable bowel syndrome, number of other things. Now what is the evidence? Well, we have animal studies. 
you have human studies. And there comes Dr. Vijay Panikar. Thanks for coming early. Okay, so these are some of the animal studies, right? See, you always start with an animal study because it's, it's not so very easy to do human studies. Very simple, you have germ-free mice and conventionally raised mice. Now a germ-free mice is 40% lesser body fat. Uh, Vijay Panikar, GF is not girlfriend, germ-free. Okay, so just in case you're confused, so I just made it clear, okay. Now, conventionally rice mites are usually a little heavier. Now, you transplant the microbiota from a conventionally raised mice to a germ-free mice, Within a week, there is a 60% increase in the body fat, increased triglyceride, increases in insulin resistance, independent of the food intake. So that means you don't really have to eat to have a bad microbiota or put on weight. Just dysbiotic gut, transfer the microbiota into somebody who had no germs. Now everything worsens within weeks. And a number of other studies also have been done on the animals. The important thing to remember is high fat diet influences bacteriotides and the firmicutes ratio. High fat diet also influences directly and indirectly the intestinal flora, the energy absorption and the harvesting of this. Now let's come to the human studies because we are all humans and we are interested in knowing what exactly happens. Fecal myota, <coughs> microbiota transplantation has been going on for almost a decade now. Different people have been doing different works. Now take the microbiota from healthy thin males and then see what happens six weeks later. Immediately there is an increase in the diversity of the microbiota, what you can see here on the top. Reduction in the short chain fatty acids, reduction in insulin resistance, increase in insulin sensitivity, and butyrate producing bacteria increases. They are good ones. So you transplant gut microbiota from healthy thin males to your subjects. This happens. Now, the same person also is the control he takes his own microbiota from his own gut. Then the diversity of the microbiota currently comes down, short chain fatty acids increase, insulin resistance increase, insulin sensitivity comes down. So <clears throat> there is something about thin people and thin microbiota. Since Vijay Panikar stays in Mumbai, there are a number of actresses who are very, very thin with size zero. If there is a way of getting their poop, then see whether we can actually try it out and then see what happens. Okay, so I think that's not going to happen. People find it extremely difficult because uh, measuring energy even through poop is, is, is a lot of work actually. So. The optimal ratio between firmicutes and bacteriotides is 12 is to 620. Now, interestingly, read just the last two lines. Don't go into the details of this particular study. <clears throat> Obese individuals, when they go on a low-calorie diet, which is considered as 800 calories per day for a year, there is a tremendous decrease in the bad microbiota or the bad bacteria and there is a tremendous increase in the good microbiota. And there is a 20% increase in the firmicutes and this was associated with an increase in the nutrient absorption of about 150 kilocalories. So bad microbiota when you increase, energy absorption also increases. So you, you, you put on more weight. So this biotic gut, people have more appetite, they eat more and then put on more weight. Now, 20% increase in bacteriotides was associated with a decrease in absorption of almost 150 kilocalories. 
Now, with all the evidence that we have with the diet, I'll come to the main thing. Can diet change the gut microbiota? <clears throat> Vegetarian diet has the best evidence, said to be very, very beneficial. Along with the other things, most importantly, the plant fibers encourage the growth of microbiota that produces short-chain fatty acids and improve your immunity, also anti-inflammatory. So the nutritional benefits and adequacy of a vegetarian diet must be judged individually. Sadly, Indian diet, Indian vegetarian diet is so different from the Western vegetarian diet. There are hardly any studies which has looked into microbiota composition of Indian vegetarian diet because it's so diversified. We don't eat vegetables the way <coughs> a Westerner eats the vegetables. So somebody need to really do this kind of a work and somebody like Nita and group who are doing a lot of nutrition and dietary work, I, I, I think should start really working on this kind of a thing. It's, it's very difficult to do these trials, expensive, but I think it's, it's worth doing. The future directions, yes, at this point of time, probiotics, prebiotics, vegetarian diet, fecal transplantation. Not that the non-vegetarian food is bad. Well, pork is said to be something that actually pushes you into dysbiosis. Red meat, high in fats, high in calories, known to push your gut to the dysbiotic gut. But if it's fish, if it's chicken, and with the right exercises, maintaining your body weight, you can still have a great symbiotic gut. So it's, it's not that you had to stop eating non-vegetarian food, you just had to be choosy about what you are eating. So summary, the gut microbiota plays a significant role in maintaining the homeostasis of human health. We know the vegetarian diet is advantageous and most importantly, people with metabolic syndrome and people with insulin resistance must start losing weight so that from dysbiotic gut to symbiotic gut, weight loss can definitely reverse this dysbiotic changes. As long as we can sustain the weight that we have lost, it's going to be great. I think with time and better understanding, the correct therapeutic options will broaden. But at this point of time, we are not too sure what we are dealing with. There is good news for Dr. Hiremat about red wine. But we will not have the discussion. We will keep it for the night. Thank you so very much.